wrestling to the max. Smackdown review. Hello and welcome to another Wrestling to the Max Smackdown Live review of the September 13th, 2016 edition. And uh, of course the After Backlash uh, edition as well. So uh, lots to discuss here. And uh, with me of course, Mr. Paul Leisure. hey yo. And joining us for the first time since we've had this uh this format here with the two separate reviews. Mr. Harry Broadhurst from the Raw Reaction. What you doing, man? What's up, Sean? Hey, Paul. Hey, bud. And of course, also from the uh, W2 Network Zone, uh, Wrestling and Route with Mr. Patrick Ketza. So, <sighs> lots of things going on for Harry. Happy to have him uh, here with us on, on this show. And guys, of course... What? Did, did, did it ever get released uh, as to the original intent of this show, actually? I think eventually, well, first we did talk about it, and then we kind of just decided to, I think then we eventually talked about just kind of making it like this. I, I remember on a, on an episode of of WTM, we actually talked about the the original version of this at least once. Yeah, because the original version of this particular show, for those that don't know, was actually supposed to be me and Sean with various rotating guests. Unfortunately, the first I got in the way and took the opportunity to do the show on a regular basis. Therefore, he recruited Paul, and Paul's done a fantastic job. So, Thank, Thankfully, Paul just kind of comes with the package. I don't have to necessarily, <laughs> like, recruit Paul sometimes. He just, like, just... He just says, hey, like, yeah, I'm good. He's like, you need me? Okay, I'm there. So, uh, but, uh, yeah. So, now that we've more, gotten all the all the pleasantries out of the way. Uh, more, more, tr- more trustworthy than an Ezekiel Elliott rookie game. <sighs> Man. Really? We gotta go there? Harry's, Harry's cutting deep. <laughs> See, that's not Ezekiel uh, Elliott's fault or anything. Uh, well, yeah, my team scored seven points. I really got no room to talk. <laughs> yeah. Hey, at least uh, both teams lost in a close one. So, you know. But as, as it turns out, of course, uh, usually what happens with these things is when you have a new champion, the new champion gets to come out and and talk for a little bit, and AJ Styles does do that. Of course, he is the face that runs the place. As uh, they like to t- tell you on uh, the ring, the ring announcer loves to tell you that constantly every time he says it. Um, but I mean, obviously, still really surreal to have AJ Styles come out and he is your WWE champion. I still looked at it and I was like, am I am really watching this right now? Like, I know you had to feel that way, Paul. I just, I can't believe this this guy just walked out with the WWE championship. I thought it looked good on him. Yeah, I thought it looked good on him too. Uh, of course, Marrow getting to mention the the only the second man ever to win both the IWGP Championship and the WWE Championship. So, some high honor there for AJ. Technically third. Kurt Angle Angle's, doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say Styles, Angle, and Lesnar, right? Yeah, but wasn't wasn't angles like a B version of the the IWGP title? Yeah, whenever Inoki left New Japan, he recognized Brock as his champion after Brock refused to work for New Japan anymore, and that had its own three champion legacy before it got thrown back in with the main one when Shutsuke beat Kurt Angle. Yeah, uh, Brock actually got had the new version of the title they just made, mm-hmm. and then. That title actually never really got to see the light of day because Brock never brought it back. So they had to, they just used the old one. Uh, so that kind of sucks. But I'm I'm sure they've 
at least cl- they, they've at, le- at least we know they cleaned that title. You know, it, it took him a <laughs> while to for uh, Michael Elgin to clean the clean the IC title. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you have this wonderful promo segment here where John Cena eventually uh, shows up. Of course, him and Styles have all that history, and then you get uh, Dean Ambrose coming out as well. And Dean cutting deep on John Cena talking, telling him he's a Hollywood part-timer. And everybody just firing shots on everybody. Shane McMahon comes out to declare there's going to be a triple threat at no mercy. So I'm going to assume that maybe that's why you didn't get the triple threat with uh, with Roman and everything else. Because they were already doing one for SmackDown later. Or perhaps we're just going to get a triple threat at, at Hell in a Cell. Since I guess everybody's just gonna follow everyone, uh, every one of these months. But I thought this, this is was what happens. Go ahead. This is what happens when you have two different writing teams, but they're writing for the same person. Very true. Uh, now that person probably not feeling too good at the moment. So maybe he's well. Apparently, according to the press release, he'll be back in the office tomorrow as usual. Ah, well. I guess it wasn't that big a deal. He had surgery, and now he's back in the office. Of course, this is Vince McMahon. You know, the guy doesn't like you to sneeze on people. So, uh, either way, Paul, I thought this was a dynamite uh, opening segment here. I thought it was great until Shane came out. Shane had might have had the most awkward delivery I've had him seen since the weeks where he first came back. Like, it was it was a little rough, but I thought everything else was great. I, AJ was was the overconfident self that we've come to know and love since he turned heel, I thought Dean and Cena were both on point. And, and I'm, there's a lot like Cena is bearing Ambrose and all this stuff. I mean, it, you knew this was coming when he came back. I'm just surprised it happened this quickly. Anything uh, on that, Harry? I'm actually going to be in the minority here. I did not entirely care for this. And my biggest problem was the run time. Uh, is it just me or did it come off kind of like an old Monday Night Raw opening promo? They went. 17 minutes into a two-hour show with the opening promo. I feel like they should have gotten to the... To the uh, like, I understand why they did as much as they did in this opening promo, but my only concern was that when you only have... Uh, I think it works out to 44, 88, an hour and a little under an hour and a half of television content that you can produce for your two-hour broadcast, the first 17 minutes or almost the first sixth of it should not be spent in the ring. On, on a promo segment. I had no issue with the content. The length is all that bothered me. I'll say this. Uh, we do need to remember that SmackDown's roster is a bit thinner. So you don't necessarily well, that, want to have needless matches out there because you need to waste time. I mean, it, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. I um, I, I didn't mo- like this. To me, I thought was the best part of the show. Honestly, there, there's a couple things that came close, but third, I thought this was the best part. Yeah, everybody was on fire here. I, mm-hmm. I love the fact that there was passion here from everybody. Cena declaring he wants to be 16-time world champion. Hopefully, that's a little bit later down the line, not just immediate. Um, considering that, you know, AJ Styles, for all the things that he's done since he's come in, he deserves to have a title reign that's longer than a, a month. But uh, we'll have to see when we get to that. And, of course, this also leads to Shane McMahon making the main event of the evening, which is AJ Styles uh, in a tag match with a partner of his choosing as John Cena and Dean Ambrose, uh, going after the fact that Ambrose and Cena uh, have some issues with each other. And we'll see that at the end, but because his eventual tag partner, not the one that gets named for him, uh, there's a reason why he is in that match. We'll we'll not go straight there as we normally would, because it does kind of go into something else that's happening here. Of course, The Miz continues to be Intercontinental Champion after Backlash, and he goes out there to kind of talk about, dude, a man... I've been the IC champ for 162 days. Uh, this title means I'm the main event every time I come out here. 
I've made this title better than 132 other people that have held it. I mean, dude, he was putting over that IC title. Like, I felt like Miz cares more about that IC title than I think anybody has in a quite a long time. And I think that's a lot of credit for Miz because a lot of times you don't see heel champions be the ones that kind of do that. A lot of times it's the face champions or you have those fighting champions that are all about, oh, I want to bring back the prestige and all this stuff. And I thought that was great from The Miz. And, of course, you get Dolph Ziggler to come out here and sort of beg and plead for a another match, uh, calling out the reason that he should get it is because Maurice got involved. Daniel Bryan comes out and says that, yes, this is happening. Uh because and then of course it works because Brian has issues with Miz and it also goes with Brian's character about he wants everything to be clean and all that stuff. I mean, overall, man, is there a, is there a time on this since the brand split that that Miz has not been killing it? Uh, no, there hasn't. And my opinion is is that Miz has been the most underrated perform and probably the most valuable performer in the WWE since WrestleMania. I, I, there might be something to that. I certainly recently, uh, now that he's had a bigger spotlight, able to shine on him, he's been absolutely not getting out of the ballpark. But really, I mean, since he's had this new character and brought Maurice in, the whole package has really worked. Uh, and clearly, they, they're they're not eager to stray away from it. In fact, they really want to accentuate it because they're dragging this out, and it's it's getting. I think it's almost as over as your main feud that you got going on on SmackDown right now. At least the miss part is that everybody else has been sort of a round table of smattering supporters. You know what, Sean? You just mentioned about how Miz is a heel that's bringing prestige to the title, and it finally reminded me of who Miz's character reminds me of. ROH that? television should be in Jay Lethal. Hmm. That's very true. I mean, he was, you know, that was all of Jay Lethal's gimmick was he was the world that's, champion, it, even though he was a TV it, champ. His TV title was more important than Jay Briscoe's heavyweight title. Yeah, very true. Uh, I, that'd be really cool if they did that with Miz. I'm, I'm totally down for that. That's honestly, they should be doing that with those secondary titles, of making them feel just as important. And anytime the Miz or whoever becomes the actual champion after the Miz, they should be wanting to be in that spot that should be wanting to have the IC title be that sort of 1A that it used to be. And uh, Miz wanting to get himself involved in this match after AJ fails on two attempts to get himself a tag partner and Baron Corbin and Kane, who both sort of laugh at him and Baron also it says, hey, I'd rather be your opponent than your uh, partner. He We actually get a return of James Ellsworth, which was awesome. Uh, he's more over than half the uh, SmackDown roster at this point. And I got, I got go two ahead. words for you, Sean. Go ahead. Colin Delaney. <laughs> uh, and then Miz beats up James Ellsworth to get in the main event. And I thought it was great because Miz has got the, he's got all the stuff going on. It, and and he has all the history. He has history with Cena. He has history with Ambrose, and of course he has history with AJ as well. If they ever, uh, if they went that way with, with Miz attacking AJ at some point, but the main event I thought was pretty good. And you had Ambrose pulling one of his Ambrose things where he's going to attack everybody because it is all about themselves when you get down to it in that match. I uh. I enjoyed the match itself. I thought that Cena posing on the turnbuckle while Ambrose stood in the ring kind of telegraphed the way we were going to go off the air. But at the same time, it makes sense for Ambrose to get the first hand over the returning Cena in the build towards the three-way. Um, I did pop for James Ellsworth seeing him again there, and I honestly think that they might have something there with him, and they could do like a like a Colin Delaney or Santino Morella kind of storyline story arc with him. I mean, they certainly could if they choose to. I SmackDown would be a great place to do that kind of story too. But I, I whether that's here or there right now, I I don't know if that's ever going to come to fruition again. But I think the main event was fine. Uh, Cena, Ambrose, 
that's a really interesting dynamic. I think that's worth probably exploring on its own at some point. But right now, I think uh, the the tension between them and their hatred over AJ is is it's very interesting. And of course, the Miz. The Miz was great. That I think the graphic that they have right now of sort of Cena and Ambrose looking at AJ in the middle with the title, I think that tells you everything you need to know. It's all mm. about two guys that don't care about AJ, and then Cena and Ambrose sort of have this little thing going in between them, but they really just want to get at AJ. Right. And uh, good, uh, good stuff at least to make your your main title. Uh, seem very, very this this big important thing that people are wanting to fight over, and then you 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 have the other things that are kind of on this show. Uh, of course, the one of the big things they were making a big deal about was Heath Slater and getting to sign his contract. So they get to follow on this story, and he does sign the contract. Uh, I love his new shirt. I saw it unveiled this morning, and I had to go make a joke about it on my Facebook. I really do want to wear that to a, you know, some job interview that I, I'm not, I don't really care about, just to see if, uh, what that person thinks of my shirt. But uh, this, uh, I, the, you get more Heath Slater being Heath Slater, which is great. The Ascension come out and they get squashed. So the Ascension are still the Ascension. I guess. I mean, geez, yep. poor guys. It doesn't matter if Vince is healthy or out injured, get, out coming off the of surgery. The Ascension will still do exactly a grand total of nothing. Yeah, so true. But I mean, once they came out, at least you knew Slater and Rhino were going to retain because we were talking earlier this week about maybe Slater and Rhino wouldn't even make it past first SmackDown with those title belts. So, <laughs> thank God for this. Uh-huh. <laughs> I made the prediction that they were going to get once again challenged by the Usos tonight on SmackDown and that the Usos were going to take the belts off of them, so I'm glad to have been wrong there. I actually like this uh, this little makeshift team of Slater and Rhino. I think they have amazing chemistry, and I know you guys did your review for Backlash last night or on Sunday night after the show with Patrick for joining you, you and Gary for Wrestling Unwrapped to the Max, kind of. But... um what I wanted to say about that was there is you can see the amazing chemistry these guys have, and a, a, a graphic illustration of that was the uh, pre-show promo that they did in the social media lounge. That may have been the best social media lounge interview I've ever seen. I could not stop laughing. Yeah, I mean, they, they are freaking awesome. And I love the fact <laughs> it seemed like Rano was about to go get a little upset if, if he Slater didn't mention that uh, he had something to do with the the title win and everything uh, I love that he like named off his kids and and all that stuff it's just man ah I, I can't get enough of he Slater right now I want I I really hope he gets to keep that keep those titles for a while and you know was, was it us that we were speculating about does he lose the do they have rhino lose the belt on the day of the primary just to just to do it i think that was us yeah <laughs> i i don't see that happening because i would imagine rhino would probably be in michigan for the actual election itself I, a lot of us want him uh up there uh capitol hill wearing the belt and uh spearing people when they disagree with his proposals <laughs> <laughs> i just want to see uh, him cutting a you know doing a a speech with the belt. That would be great. Uh, if he doesn't use the belt while he's campaigning, he's missing a major opportunity. My name is Terrence Gerwin, and I can be your champion. I almost feel like that's part of it. Like, I think that was a sort of a thing that they might have discussed. Oh, the, the WWE chose Rhino for Slater's tag team partner in order to get some publicity for the belt. I'm almost sure of it. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, it, they kind of ended up falling up and falling in their lap that this worked really well, as well. So yeah, yeah, I, I think it was originally done as a way to get as a way to get Slater an actual contract, and as well as to have something for Rhino to do. And the fact that Rhino and Slater have such amazing chemistry is just one of those things that they kind of locked their way into. I just think that you know it's 
it's cool because he Slater sort of always been that guy that he's done these funny gimmicks and the stuff with the legends was great and all that. And then you always say, oh, man, this guy's got a lot of potential here. But because of his size or because, you know, you've always classified him as a jobber, he, oh, he always needs to stay that way. And I think this is one of the pluses of the brand split. They've gotten to do something with, with a guy like Heath Slater. They probably would have never been able to get out of that rut that he was in. Right. Well, let me, let me put this into perspective for you here, Sean. Of the original eight members of the Nexus, Heath Slater and Darren Young are the only two that still have wrestling contracts. Well, doesn't uh, doesn't PJ Black have one? Not with the WWE. Ah, well, you said wrestling, so. I meant WWE wrestling contracts, like contracts with the company that the Nexus started in. Heath Slater and Darren Young, ah, the two okay. outcomes of Nexus are the only two that are still viably employed as wrestlers by the company. Eh, whoever would have thought Heath Slater would be the one that's the most over out of all of them at this point, too. Because Darren Young is making himself anything but great again with that terrible feud with Titus Young right now. Uh, or Titus, Titus Young. O'Neil. Uh, Titus O'Neil, yeah, see? I'm already getting the, the names mixed uh, up. I, it, I don't it, care it, that much. It, 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 it's Sean O'Clock, apparently, here. What up, what culture? But anyway, um, no, what I was going to say about the whole the whole Eve Slater thing, like you were saying, though, is Slater's always been one of those guys, much like a Damian Sandow, that's always done what's been asked of him without, with minimal complaining about it, and it's good to see him finally getting rewarded for it. Yeah, it makes you wonder, you know, if those guys might have stuck around a little bit longer until the brand split had already started. Who knows, you know? But, uh, I mean, they did have a few, uh, I mean, namely the, the women got to, we, we found out who the number one contender is. You got a fatal five way. I thought this match was, was good. You had some, some pretty cool, uh, them trying stuff again in, in multi person matches. And Alexa Bliss, of all people, wins. Um, they did more to sort of keep the Carmella and Nikki feud going, uh, which, again, I'm glad that they're doing more than just one women's feud. And I thought Alexa Bliss really got to show a lot in that Talking Smack interview. I learned uh, so much more about her than I think I have in her entire time in WWE, period, even in NXT. Yeah, well, I mean... Just her staring at Daniel and saying, I'm nothing like you. That was all I needed, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just want to say that as somebody who has been a major supporter of Alexa, even back to when she was in NXT, I'm very happy to see her getting where she's getting as far as her character development as well as her in-ring abilities as well. I'm really looking forward to seeing what's next, what's next here and... I'm going to be entirely honest with you. I wouldn't be opposed to the thought of putting the uh, putting the SmackDown Women's title on Alexa. Uh, I really hope Becky has one of those long, like really just kind of career-defining reigns. Uh, personally, just because one, she deserves it. She is carrying that SmackDown Women's division and just. You know, I, I think it should really be about let's establish a champion, make this title really mean something, and then if you want to have Alexa or whoever uh, take it from her later, uh, I'm all for that. Just I do not like these whole let's have the title try to establish the person. I'd rather the person establish the title. I, I think part of my thing about that whole situation, though, is Sean, is that uh, I honestly feel like they might have been better off with a heel first champion, though, and letting Becky have the full chase to a defining moment. You know, I think uh, putting it on Becky first helps just because I think the, the heels are the less established group in the uh, the six-woman division they have over on SmackDown. We don't know. Carmella's still growing, and so is Alexa Bliss, and I think this is an opportunity to let both of them at least step out uh, and establish themselves some and, uh, with Becky being your sort of rock to, to work with. Yeah, I think if you were going to pick a heel, I mean, Natalia would not have been bad at all if he wanted to go that route, uh, especially as a sort of a, like, thank you for being with us so long kind of thing. That would have been fine, as as uh, Patrick mentioned in the in the roundtable that we did for the website. But, uh, you know, 
I don't think they went wrong with what they decided. It's better than going with the Nikki Bella choice that a lot of people thought they would have done. So, for me, I'm kind of happy with what they're doing. And Alexa's a good first feud for her. I, I don't think there's any question that she's going to retain against Alexa, though. I'd like to see the belt around Alexa's waist sooner rather than later, but I don't think there's any question that when it comes to No Mercy, Becky's going to retain. Do you, do you think we get two women's matches at No Mercy, or maybe one on the pre-show, one on the main show? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Carmella definitely. and Nikki, yeah, bound to be on that card for sure. All right, well, we got to remember how, again, how thin that roster is. And even with the addition of, hey, we talked about him on Monday, Paul. And look, he's already there, Jack Swagger. Uh, that division is, I mean, that, that whole roster is still very thin. And you need to have the two women. To me, again, like, I've said this a couple of times, and I feel like SmackDown is in the early days of NXT kind of territory. We're really trying to establish the brand and what it is and and all that kind of stuff. And having an identity of, like, really showcasing the women and having them be an important part and both matches being on the card and everything, I think that really says a lot. Then rather than, okay, well, we can't have two women's matches, so we got to stick one on the pre-show. I like the, the – we've really tried to just tell this story with Carmella and Nikki. It deserves to be on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I mean, what did you, Jack Swagger didn't do a whole lot here. He kind of just introduced himself and sort of uh, made a point that he's going to be a player, it seems like, and there's something there with him and Corbin. Uh, you like that, Harry? Between last night's bit with him on Raw losing to Jinder and then the backstage interviewer and tonight's thing on SmackDown with him walking out, I found myself fascinated. I was unaware Jack Swagger was still in toy. <laughs> Hard to blame me because that promo was not very good. And I say this as somebody who is a genuine fan of his in-ring work. Like I enjoy him when he was when he when he was the heavyweight champion. Even though he was facing some, let's be honest, some substandard competition and guys like Kali and Big Show and stuff. He was holding his own and having entertaining matches. And then obviously he had a couple of really good matches with Ray Junior. But Ever since the uh, the whole the whole marijuana pop when he was shooting with Del Rio, he's been pretty much persona non existent on WWE television. Yeah, I am. I think also they sort of did that run with him, and then they did the that run right around the time when when he had that, and they kind of realized, well, this is about where Jack Swagger is going to be at. And I guess they kind of felt like it was unnecessary to just keep kind of pushing him. But he did have those uh, those pretty good matches with Rusev for a while. And that yeah. was pretty much that was pretty much the last time he was relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, what two a year and a half ago? Right. Yeah. So there, thereabouts. Yeah. Perfect for the SmackDown Welcome to the Rebuilding Project. Yeah, exactly. Let's let's just rebuild people. And uh, once again, Baron Corbin just beats up Apollo Crews. So don't know if this is going to lead to anything with Crews or we're just... Do you think maybe we're in for some kind of repackaging with Apollo Crews or something? Or is this I, just going to be think- anything with him? I think he's going to go away and then reappear as Apollo Creed. What is there to repackage? He hasn't had a gimmick yet. I don't know. <laughs> Turn him? I mean, do no, something? He, the, you know. He doesn't work He doesn't work as a heel. He's more of a plucky baby face. He's been a plucky baby face since he's come into the WWE. He doesn't really work as a heel. Uh, the issue that I have for Apollo well, is... If he gets to show some personality, I don't mind, because right now all he does is smile and it does nothing. There's, you know what I think? I honestly think that Apollo would be better off on Raw. And there is a very specific person on Raw who I think would do wonders for his career, especially since that person's other client is only part-time. Because you know, as you I... mentioned... 
Uh, Apollo has no discernible personality, and promos have never been a strong suit of his, even back to his days as Uha Nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's true. I just, I don't know if Paul Heyman is interested in being full-time either, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. He seems to kind of like his, uh, uh, what you may call it? He seems to kind of like his part-time status as well, where he can work with his company and do all that kind of stuff. I mean, his you know, I, I, I honestly think of maybe you need to just have him do some kind of tag run or something or just. Something where he's not just being a singles guy getting beat all the time. I mean, I think it's a fine idea. Tagging up with Kalisto might work. I mean, that you could make for a fun tag team there, but both guys aren't really super strong at the promo thing. I th ultimately, at the end of the day, you got to be able at least to be okay. Where the hell is Kalisto? I guess he just got beat up by Baron Corbin so bad. He's just too many garage shots. I blame those damn clangy poles personally. <laughs> Maybe that too. Uh, the Uso, the Usos just basically beat up the hype bros again. Um, Do you what happened to the black the gear? Ball? Do what? Do you buy this heel turn at all? I liked it yesterday or on Sunday. Uh, I wish they would have kept the black gear, though. I kind of... like I, I'm interested, but we still haven't got a lot of exposition into who they are now yet, so hopefully that's still building there. They, I think they need a theme music change, honestly, too. 100% agree. And a Titantron change wouldn't be the worst thing either, especially since their Titantron still says play hard in the paint and they don't wear the face paint anymore. It's so funny because Ket uh, brought this up on, on the Backlash review, too. And uh, honest to God, I don't think myself, Sean, or Gary pay attention to any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys. Yeah, this is why we do a podcast together, even though we bust each other's stones, because we know it's pretty much the same stuff. <laughs> hey, it helps when you have somebody that does notice that, you know. Um I think that I think the thing is though I think WWE kind of thinks that nobody's noticing that either, so they probably just assume that oh well we'll get to it when we get to it let's see if this gets over and if it does then we'll give them some new theme music and we'll do whatever. I just think that you need to either go all in or just you can't half-ass a heel turn. You you either you got to go all in with the thing. Mm -hmm. So you're you're saying you have to whole ass it. You know, whatever works I mean, for you. you. If you're going to be a heel, being an ass is kind of in the uh, equation there. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, I like that we're trying to get some sympathy with the hype bros here, but I don't know. I don't know what this sort of did a whole lot for them, other than we're just continuing to work on the knee thing for writing. I... I, I don't think this did anything for them because I don't think most uh, most SmackDown Live audiences have any reason to care about Mojo Rawley yet. I think they did Mojo a tremendous disservice by just having him drafted and not having him have any kind of backstory before the Hypros came up to SmackDown. If you were going to bring the Hypros to SmackDown, they'd have been better off having them come up with a couple of weeks of video packages, much the same way they've done for a guy like Kurt Hawkins. Well, the thing is, NXT didn't care about Mojo Rawley either. Eh, well, that's because they ain't hype. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, anything for you on on that fall? Or? I um, I it's not like Mojo's this great sparkling talent that they have or anything like that. But I mean, having something in line for him whenever he came up would have been nice. But we have we still haven't got a lot of exposition about who the hype bros are yet either. Just uh. Some picture-in-picture -picture promos. That's really not a lot. They, hopefully, them and the Usos can be somewhat of a compelling story that you can use to help both guys out. Because the tag division is super weak outside of the team you invested so heavily in, the major champions and American Alpha. And everybody else is either partway to trying to be interesting or just there. Right. Well, I mean... 
Like, that's, that's my that's my biggest concern for teams like like the Vaude villains are non-existent now. The, the Rizongo is non-existent now. Mm-hmm. Um, these are these are two teams that that should be able to be players in this tag team division. I say Brizongo especially because frankly, Tyler and 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 Fandango are killing that gimmick. They are making it one of the more entertaining things on the episodes of television that they get to appear on. They just never get to appear on television anymore. Right. Their match with American Alpha was really good. Yeah, Fandango doesn't get enough credit for actually. For how good of a wrestler he is, I mean, we know how we know how good Tyler Breeze is, but and then, like you said, every time I've seen a vignette with these guys or anything like that, I want to see more. I wish that the company felt that way, but again, you know, this is kind of the thing sometimes where you do only have two hours and you got to figure out what you want to use that two hours for, and you can't develop everybody on every episode. Do you think that SmackDown needs an hour exclusive network shows maybe sometime later in the week? Say like how how Raw and SmackDown used to have Velocity and Heat respectively. Do you think that perhaps the way to go might be to uh, give an hour an hour network show to each brand to help expand on their lower division talents? They have that Superstar is a main event. Okay. Are they actually using them brand specifically? I, they're supposed to. Uh, they, I thought they were. I just, I don't think that they're telling stories on superstars and whatever. You know, they're yeah. just kind of having matches. The last live show I went to, it was, it was just matches. So, I mean, those are, I mean, no, the main event is still uh, like on a three week delay because of the deal with Sky that prevents them to have it every week like superstars. But still, they are there. It's just. If WWE would even think about, oh my God, do we want to write for another hour of TV when we're having a hard enough time writing for the five hours plus the pay per views that we have right now? Um, in which, you uh-huh. know, let's let's be honest, it's enough of what they do. I was under the impression that uh, once the cruiserweight division comes to Raw, they'll give the first hour to the cruiserweight division, and then kind of put Raw and SmackDown in even footing from there. I think that's the impression that some people have. I don't think that I've heard anything like that, that they're just going to just... The first hour is going to be exclusively Cruiserweight because, for one, I don't see WWE getting away from that opening promo thing. And secondly, it's just... I think that kind of... You're going to end up getting to that audience where you're only going to get the hardcores because what if the casual fans don't give a crap about the cruiserweight division and they just don't tune in in that first hour if you keep doing that? I think what you'll probably see is you'll get two cruiserweight matches a show and they'll be dispersed out between two different times and I'm sure they'll probably always get the death spot right before the main event because they need something to kind of keep the crowd in there. Uh, maybe I'll be completely wrong, and maybe they'll actually try to tell stories with the Cruiserweight division and everything, but I'm not going to hold my breath right now. I think there are plenty of stories to tell there. I mean, if you've watched the CWC, if people are watching the CWC, they know that there are people there with interesting backstories, TJP, Cedric Alexander, and, and the like. Yeah, I mean, that's my big question, Mark, with the Cruiserweight division is, is it just matches? Because so far, you haven't really... You've just shown pictures of guys who are competing. We haven't gotten any stories or anything like that. And I'm assuming they're counting on you having watched Cruiserweight Classic to care about who these people are going to be, which could sort of backfire on them. But we still don't even know exactly what this division is going to do yet. So, Yeah, next Monday is going to be super interesting. Of course, mm-hmm. you know, they have the final uh, t- you know, tomorrow. So uh, that's also going to be super fun to watch and everything. Are you guys are you guys doing a W two M extra for the final tomorrow? Or are you going to wait and do it with a W two M original on Thursday? Thursday, because the whole point of splitting the shows is so we don't have to do so many extras. Uh, All right. Which FC Dallas just won the U.S. Open Cup, so awesomeness. Woo. Uh, woo. Uh, but uh, yeah, so. I think other than the – we haven't talked about the Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt thing. I think it's the only thing we have not discussed yet, which is basically Orton 
cutting a promo, um, you know, saying that he's pretty much not scared of this face of fear, and that the one that's actually in fear is Bray Wyatt of Randy Orton, and Bray sort of just says, well, you gotta know when to risk it and when not to, and it's sort of all a ploy so that Eric Rowan can go out there and beat up Orton, but he just gets hit with an RKO, and again, we're just kind of ex- trying to extend this view as much as we can, which I don't I don't have a problem at all when you do this whole let's not try to touch each other thing. I rather much appreciate that than them having five matches before we even get to No Mercy. But, you know, this is going to be sort of hard to keep your attention for that long, I think. I'm uh, I'm real curious if you guys even care anymore after what happened at Backlash. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we t- we talked about this area. I kind of want to get your th- like. I thought they completely undid everything they did earlier in the night, and giving Bray the countout win when Orton comes and gets involved, and you have Kane beat Bray Wyatt like that. Like I felt like it was almost you're going two steps backward to go a step forward. Um, pardon the phraseology here. We have been informed that Randy or- or Bray Wyatt will compete in a no hard, no holds barred match. Easy for me to say, no holds barred match against this opponent. Me sitting at my buddy's place watching the pay per view. Please don't let it be Kane. 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 Damn it! <laughs> Did you really expect anybody else though? Uh, I made a brash prediction that it was going to be Samoa Joe, actually. You're a dreamer. Yeah, I can respect that. I am. But at the same time, I can't think of a better person for Joe to debut against somebody that's a similar size and wrestles a similar style. I can't disagree, but I just don't see that happening where he just shows up on a random SmackDown. It was a pay-per-view. Well, yeah, pay-per-view. Never mind. But I saw some people saying that Samoa Joe should have been AJ's partner tonight. No, it's like it's No, that I one hundred percent disagree with. But uh yeah, I mean this is this is gonna be one of those things. Let's see if they even try to make this interesting or if this is just gonna be okay, Randy Orton has a match with Eric Rowan next week and then after that it's just back to the drawing board. But Well yeah, they got four well, weeks of this. Can I make a bold prediction as to who's gonna get involved? Sure. A returning Luke Harper. See, I was really curious about that. If the lights went out, it was going to be him or not. Uh, because One, I, I think was... SmackDown could use the extra team. And two, I, I just really want to see him work again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the only thing was, is with what happened to Rowan tonight, I wouldn't have wanted that to happen to Harper on his re-debut. Yeah. So in, in that context, I'm glad that it was Rowan because let's be honest, Rowan's kind of a jobber in WWE lexicon now. I mean, the last time we saw him was like four weeks ago, and that was when Bray turned his back on him. And now suddenly he's back with Bray again after missing a month because, you know, reasons. He had a new look. Yeah, same, same dropping Eric Rowan. <laughs> <laughs> But I think we sort of covered everything on the show. Uh, all we got to do is give it a rating here. What do you think, Harry? I'm trying to think if we missed anything else because I feel like I feel like we missed something here. Let's see. We talked about we talked about all the main story. Yeah, we talked about Usos hype bros. We talked about the women's match. Wow, we really did cover everything that quickly. Yeah, it's kind of happens. See what happens when your shows are two hours instead of three and you only have to provide an hour and a half of content? It's easier <laughs> to get through. Gee, if only a certain network would take that hit for a certain Monday night show. Actually, we normally tend to cover Raw in about the same amount of time. Right now we're running 45 minutes. So it's all about just in how you do your show. But Well, uh, I, 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 I tend to talk a lot too, so there's that. That's okay. Everybody has their way of you know, handling stuff. I and mean, so, what do you think on a rating there, Harry? 
I assume we're using numerical scale here. Yes. Okay. Um, six. Good, uh, good lead towards No Mercy. Pretty decent follow-up to Backlash. I think the biggest thing that hurt, hurt SmackDown tonight is the fact that Raw gave away everything for back, from Backlash to the audience watching Raw. I think if you would have had the Raw commentators completely ignore the Backlash pay-per-view, you would have built up a lot more intrigue for tonight's episode of SmackDown. And hopefully going forward, that's something that we can work into the storyline there. How do y'all feel about that, though? Like, I get that they're sort of making fun, and they're it's a, they're competing, and they're taking shots, whatever, but I feel like Raw should be ignoring what happens on SmackDown in those situations and highlighting your Clash of Champions review, not talking about what happened at a SmackDown-only fair review the night before. Like... I'm okay with Mick Foley giving a shout-out to Becky Lynch because it's well-established that him and Becky are close. But, like, like um, Michael Cole talking about the fact that Heath Slater and Rhino came out of the SmackDown pay-per-view tag team champions, what the hell does Michael Cole care about the SmackDown tag team titles? Yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. I He shouldn't. They should be keeping them separate, but they've... The only thing they've really done to keep them separate is different rosters and having different stories. But otherwise, they uh, they continue to mention stuff. So I don't I don't know if I should be surprised by this or not. Yeah, I mean it's just like them making this the dumb joke about like oh look at how they crown their SmackDown champions with those goofs over there and just you know them having to acknowledge that AJ is a champion now and all that. And it's just like. This is Raw. Focus on what's happening on Raw. Don't worry about what's happening over there, but it is what it is. Um, so, yeah, Paul, what do you think for rating-wise? Uh, I was thinking six and a half. It was a fine show. It wasn't anything spectacular, but I, I think the storytelling was solid, especially around your titles, and uh, everything else was kind of just sort of there, but I have no interest in Orton Wyatt after Sunday. That kind of sucks. Yeah, that does suck. I'm a big Bray Wyatt fan, and Randy Orton's been pretty good since his return. So it just kind of sucks that, you know, we can't be invested in a story with, with two guys that you kind of like. Uh, did you – we talked about Alexa Bliss's uh, interview. Did you like the Baron Corbin one on Talking Smack? It's okay. I didn't feel. I I I've never been a giant Corbin fan, and I don't know. I don't know if he still has that. Like he never seems to have that drive or that want to really go further. Unless you're watching Breaking Ground, then he does. <laughs> <laughs> I. I want to say that I actually enjoyed Corbin and Cruz on the pre-show on Sunday. I thought that that was a pretty decently put together match there. Honestly, it kind of feels like Corbin's treading water until Kalisto's clear to return to action. I mean, they uh, on Talking Smack, they did sort of, again, have him discuss Jack Swagger, so perhaps that's where they're going to go. And I don't have a problem with that, because I bet those two could actually have a pretty damn good match. Uh, but, uh, you know... It's still just Corbin doing his whole I don't give a crap gimmick and I don't like anybody and that's fine. Just uh, they got to channel it into something because I think normally him doing the I don't give a crap gimmick and just beating up people would get over. But I think Roman Reigns has kind of put that thing in in a hole where I don't think anybody that has that gimmick, maybe aside from Samoa Joe, is going to get over with it. So you might have to do something, tweak it a little bit. Any ideas, guys, on is there anything they can maybe do to make you care about Baron Corbin? Uh, uh uh-uh. I think the lone wolf needs a manager, unfortunately. Whether he wants to admit it, and I think the perfect person for him would be the heat magnet that is Eva Marie. 
I think they have different plans for Eva Marie. I, I honestly got to think that SmackDown Women's Championship is bound for her waist sooner rather than later. I don't know exactly what to do with Baron because there's not like there's a giant face on the roster that he can just immediately go up and start having beef with right away right now, you know, because they're all taken. They're all worried about each other, and he's just sort of left to languish in a mid-card that still needs a lot of development. So him beating up Kalisto, who admittedly I don't think a lot of people care about, or him beating up Apollo Crews, who nobody cares about, or whoever else you can come up with that's a face down in the mid-card scene, nobody's really going to get behind. So unless you were working with one of the big, do- the big dogs, you're not, you're not going to get anywhere with him. Maybe Dolph at some point. Oh, if they have to run that into the ground. That's that's my only problem. <laughs> they they ran that feud into the ground. I, so, I, who else is there over there? You know. <laughs> I honestly think we'll see a Dolph Ziggler heel turn before we see a Ziggler Corbin feud again. You know. Um, yeah, that's the point. There is, if if they wanted to do something with singles wise, I mean, the perfect person would be Heath Slater. But uh, you know, because you could get the sympathy for Slater, and maybe you have Rhino come in there and and kind of save him a couple times, and it leads to more of Rhino and Corbin. Uh, well, but. They have, they have- they have history too. Sorry to sorry to interject there, but they have history too. weren't they teammates in the uh, the memorial to the Dusty Memorial Tournament? And if I'm not mistaken, did Corbin and Rhino go to the final of that to lose to Joe and Valor? They did indeed. Yes, they did indeed. Um, yeah. So and then Corbin turned on him, right? So. I mean, so there, there's a history you could play off of there very easily. I mean, it would be a good start for him. We'll have to see if they even broach that at all. But, yeah, so I'm going to go with six and a half as well. Do you think, you know, the match, I mean, not the match, the show, there's really nothing uh, bad, just, more storyline development, storyline development to No Mercy, and overall an easy two hours to watch, as SmackDown has been for a while. So nothing uh, bad on that part. So, uh, Harry, I mean, do you want to uh, plug your, your stuff here? Uh, well, there's no reaction from this week because, unfortunately, Tony and Rick both had to work, and obviously my personal life being what it is right now, it's kind of worked out for me to have the night off just to clear my head. But um, we will be back next Monday with Tony Acero, your colleague at 411 Mania, as well as the man from the Cajun Corner, Rick DeLon, of Facebook, also of Facebook's Fantasy Wrestling League, which, by the way, if you guys haven't had a chance to check out yet, I highly suggest you do so. It definitely adds an extra added value of intrigue to the, watching the shows and hoping that your particular team does pretty well during the shows so that way you can build up your points and stuff. Uh, there's a free league as well as a buy-in league, too, so you can check out the FWL page there. Um, you can also listen to myself and Patrick Ketza Sunday nights, usually around 8, 8.30-ish here on the W2M Network as we present Wrestling Unwrapped. We will have a show this Sunday. However, the show is, that we're doing is still up in debate because, unfortunately, our schedules might not allow for the rewatch of Femme Fatale's 5 that we were planning on doing. We'll keep you guys up to date on our own Facebook page, which is facebook.com backslash wrestling unwrapped. All right. And, of course, you can check us out on uh, Wrestling of the Max each uh uh, Tuesday morning and Friday morning, uh, lots of stuff to uh, discuss. We have a the first uh, Destruction show to preview on uh, New Japan as, as New Japan gets back into the swing of things after uh, the G1 and all that. Uh, for their three Destruction shows that they're going to have kind of de- uh, separated out between two weeks here and. We'll also, of course, have more on TNA, more on uh, NXT, and, of course, that, that Cruiserweight Classic final 
which should provide some great action. And, of course, we'll get to find out who the Cruiserweight Classic champion is and if they actually get any kind of title or if it's just going to be that trophy. We'll be interesting to see if we, we get that or if they wait for Raw to sort of announce that on any kind of level. Go ahead. Prediction. I got TJP. I, uh... I think that's where both me and Sean have been since it became apparent that uh, who was signing and who wasn't. But uh, I think TJP, great pick. Ibushi has officially come out and said that uh, he wants to help grow Japanese wrestling. So it seems like he is for sure not signing. Uh, I would say don't totally, you know think that Grand Metallic doesn't have a shot in here because I think they're really behind him and uh, they they like what they've gotten from him. So I think TJP certainly is your sort of, he could be a face for that division. He's a guy that I think a lot of people can relate to. Uh, you know, you still got the whole thing with Grand Metallic being in the mask and that sort of, you know, you've already sort of bombed with Kalisto. Will people get get behind that outside of that CWC and NXT level? Um, we'll have to see, but TJP kind of seems like the guy to go with here. But uh, uh, oh, go ahead. As much as, as, as impressed as I've been, more or less by Grand Metallic, I actually think the ESJ knocks him off at the semifinals. Wouldn't be surprised either. Because I fully expect to see Zack Saber Jr. sign full time as well after this is over, and once he gets his, I think it was some visa issues or something that he was going through or something. Well, last we heard, he had dreams. He still he had things he still wanted to do, and that that's why he was not signing. But perhaps you know, in this time that these shows have been taped, he might have changed his mind. We don't know, you know. Yeah. But yeah, I'd imagine they would have shown him. Yeah, you know, on one of these things on Raw, if, if he was going to sign. Uh, do you think we get any non-tournament matches tomorrow night? We do. We got the tag team title match for NXT. Yeah, the Revival going uh, challenging, or Gargano and Champa, as a matter of fact, challenging the Revival. I'm sure we'll get some more. They've released a couple of the matches that they've taped over the last couple of tapings on the Cruiserweight Classic page on Facebook. Yeah, so I'm sure we'll get some... I don't know if there's any dream matches, per se, that are out there that they haven't done or whatever, but I bet we'll get some kind of showcase matches and stuff like that, just to kind of pad out the two hours. I have a showcase match that I'm I'm hoping that they do, because it's honestly the two men that I was most impressed with during this tournament. Even though one of them got knocked out in the second round, the other one got knocked out in the quarterfinals. I want Akira Tozawa versus Cedric Alexander. That would be awesome. I think it'd be cool. Uh, Roe Mendoza and Rich Swan would be pretty awesome, too. Uh, but yeah, we'll have more of that on the regular episode. And of course, be checking out for uh, Paul's Wrestling Time Machine. Go vote, guys. Go vote in that uh, Wrestling to Max group. Go find the, go, you know, go go to W2Nut.com, folks. Go to W2Nut.com and go find the post for Wrestling Time Machine. You can vote in that poll as well, and you can help Paul figure out where he's going first uh, for for uh, the first episode, or, well, really the second, but, like, the first episode that, that has, like, what he's going to be doing on the show. Right. Uh, you know, is is he doing our review shtick? No. In a very small way, yes. <laughs> It's older stuff, but I'm focusing on an entire year's worth of shows from a promotion, not just DVDs. Oh, yeah. well, that's actually an interesting concept. Yeah, see? See? Everybody bringing awesome stuff here. So, And, of course, always check out check out the site for Paul's ROH and Lucha Underground reviews. Uh, so, you know, you don't want to miss that. And, yeah, check out the site for so much other stuff, like all the football content that gets out there, at least one a day, and the gaming stuff, and and everything else. So, all right, everybody. Uh, We will see you a little bit down the road. Enjoy that Cruiserweight Classic uh, final show. And later. Deuces! The 
following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.